40 years ago, my grandmother had to make a choice. The capital, South Vietnam, was under heavy fire from an advancing northern army. Her cousin told her, the city of Saigon will soon fall under communist rule. The war will be over. You can either stay here or you can come with me. I'm getting on a boat and I'm leaving our homeland. At the time, my grandfather was in a city miles away distributing rice to the poor. And so my grandmother had to make this very difficult decision for herself, four children, and two very young granddaughters who just happened to be spending the night away from their parents at grandma's house. With the hope of a better future for her children and her grandchildren, my grandmother chose to get on this boat. I was born in Texas, and my grandmother raised me until I was old enough to go to school. I still speak Vietnamese with a Texan twang. My grandmother was my first teacher, a woman who cannot read, cannot write, cannot do math, because she never had the chance to go to school herself. Because of her choice, I had the chance to be the first person in my family to go to college. As a college student, I was terrified of my professors. I had little idea what I wanted to do with my career until I took a class called Organic Chemistry. Thanks to professors Overman, Nowick, Moore, and Shea, I fell in love with the subject. After graduating from UC Irvine, I decided to study organic chemistry for another eight years with professors McMillan, Raymond, and Bergman. These professors truly inspired me, but I confess, they continued to intimidate me. The only way I could overcome my fear of professors was to become one myself. One of these things isn't quite like the others. Today I teach OCHEM to over 650 students every year, and I terrify my students. Many of my students approach the subject having heard scary stories about organic chemistry before even setting foot in the classroom. What I want to do today is share my passion for organic chemistry with you to hopefully share a perspective that will allow you to look at your world through a chemist's view with slightly less fear and slightly more hope. As a child, like many children, my favorite toy was Legos. I loved the imaginary worlds that I could create out of these tiny building blocks. What fascinated me about chemistry was when I realized that everything in the real world is also made up of tiny building blocks called atoms. Organic chemistry sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but it simply refers to the branch of chemistry that focuses on one atom, and that's the carbon atom. Out of the 100 atoms known, more than 100 atoms known. The carbon atom is a sweet spot, and many things are made out of carbon. For example, our furry beloved mascot, the anteater, is made up of amino acids, the building block of life. But an amino acid is basically a carbon framework decorated with hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. DNA, this famous molecule that allows you to pass on your genetic traits. This is also a molecule composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen with a few phosphorus atoms thrown in. Carbohydrates are our foods, but they are also six-membered rings made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In addition to all of these naturally occurring things, all of my grandmother's heart medications are also made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. My friend Jose tells me it's really easy to remember that all organic molecules are made up of C-H-O-N because in Spanish slang, it's a word that means underwear to him. What drew me to organic chemistry was this power to create new molecules that did not exist before in nature, like Lego building blocks allow us to do. But this very power is also a source of fear in the general public. The fear of chemistry is such a growing concern 
that my colleagues in Switzerland have created a brochure. On the outside, it says, imagine a chemical-free world. When you open the brochure, there's a cartoon of a man choking and dying because there's no oxygen to breathe and no water to drink. This fear, though, is useful for selling products that are 100% chemical-free or 100% natural because there's a bias in the general public, this idea that if something is created in the laboratory, it's automatically dangerous, whereas if something's isolated from nature, it's automatically safe and good for you. This plant happens to be hemlock. When Socrates was sentenced to death for corrupting the youth, he was asked to drink a concoction brewed from hemlock, uh, which ultimately killed him because of all the deadly poisons it contains. So if somebody tries to convince you to take this dietary supplement just because it's 100% natural, I hope you'll cite this classic example and say, but look what happened to Socrates. So I have some bad news for you. It turns out that everything actually is toxic, even water. If you consume too much water, it can kill you. And it was best expressed by this idea that it's actually the dose that makes the poison. And so what's important is that we understand what we create and we learn how to improve the molecules so that they will function to better our lives. My research program here at UC Irvine is inspired by two naturally occurring molecules. There's so many carbon atoms in these molecules that we use these line structures where every vertex or point represents a carbon atom. So these are two very large rings isolated from nature. One comes from a fungus, the other one comes from a soil bacteria, and both have changed the world. Erythromycin is an antibiotic that saved countless lives. Cyclosporin is an immunosuppressant. After transplant surgery, this medicine prevents the patient from rejecting the transplanted organ. Imagine if we could build these molecules very efficiently in the laboratory. Could we then tweak their structures? Because they are gifts of nature, but they're not without their own side effects and problems. And so rather than building the next generation of iPhones, you could create the next generation of antibiotics or immunosuppressants. By tweaking these structures even further, we could imagine coming up with the next generation of treatments for Parkinson's disease, cancer, or Alzheimer's. And so it's this idea of building molecular architecture that really inspires my research team. Molecules are three-dimensional structures just like buildings. And so the students in my laboratory must learn the tricks of the trade, how to be a construction worker of molecules, learning the tools to isolate, purify, and characterize what they've made. But sometimes, the tools that we need to construct these complex structures are not available. And so my students are also very interested in inventing new tools or chemical reactions that allow us to make these complex molecules. And then finally, the same way that one needs an architect to design a building, my students also use their creativity and imagination to build and design uh, molecules. And so they're training as molecular architects. The Nobel laureate M.L. Fisher published a blueprint that allowed him to stitch together two amino acids to make what's called a peptide. And this blueprint is over 100 years old. It's been extremely useful for building peptide-based therapeutics. But there are some challenges. So the Roche Pharmaceutical Company, in order to make 1,000 kilograms of an anti-HIV peptide called Fusion, to make only 1,000 kilograms of this, they had to generate 45,000 kilograms of waste. This means to make a hamster's worth of medicine, they required an elephant's worth of just waste products. And so this isn't a very uh, sustainable technology. What my laboratory is interested in doing is answering this question, can we develop a greener blueprint for making peptides? Whether you know it or not, I need to acknowledge all of you for paying your taxes last April, because this project is now funded by the National Science Foundation. And so our idea is to design a blueprint where we only generate water and vinegar as the byproducts. 
And this is a big challenge, but my students have made progress in this area. And they've been able to recently create a blueprint and build an anti-malarial cyclic peptide in a much more efficient way. So oftentimes, we have this idea that the people, the scientists who are really making an impact are people who look like Einstein. Okay, Professor Apicarian here does kind of look like Einstein. <laughs> but Einstein was in his early 20s when he came up with some of his most important ideas and contributions. And it's still true today. My research team is made up entirely of students in their early 20s. And through their passion, their hard work, their creativity, and optimism, they are making a difference. Now, the most important products that will ever come out of my lab are my students, and they'll take their training in molecular architecture to go on to create the next generation of medicines and sustainable technologies. But they do need the public's help and support. A few years ago, I had the chance to uh, talk about my research in Spain, and afterwards, a reporter approached me and asked me a series of kind of tough questions. Uh, what was my favorite element? I said vanadium, because it starts with a V. Uh, what was my favorite movie? I said, Elf, because Will Ferrell's awesome. And then she asked me, what was my dream? And I said, well, my dream is for the future generation to have a better life than the previous one. And I realized recently that this dream is the same dream my grandmother had 40 years ago. Like me, many of you may wondered, what happened to my grandfather? When he returned home, the neighbors told him that they saw his family leave on the back of a cargo truck, and a bomb had fallen behind them. When the dust cleared, they assumed that his entire family had been killed. Years later, my grandfather discovered that his family was alive and living in the United States, and he tried many times to escape or flee illegally from Vietnam. After 17 years, he was reunited with my grandmother. I met my grandfather when I was 16 years old, and we had the shared experience of taking our driving exam at the same time, uh, except he passed on the first try and I passed on the third. <laughs> my grandparents' story has helped provide me with some perspective and encouragement during times when I felt I had a big decision to make. Their story helped encourage me during times when I felt my life is just not working out the way I planned. And I want to encourage all of you. Sometimes you feel there's an ocean to cross to reach your goals. You're not even sure what lies on the other side. And other times you may come home and feel you've lost everything and have to start over from scratch. At a recent family gathering, I snapped this photo of my grandfather with his great-grandson, Jaden, who's half black, half Asian, 100% adorable. And I found a very old photo, a 20-year-old photo of myself as a college student when I decided, hey, I want to grow up to be like my OCHEM professor, Larry Overman. I'm still working on that goal. What chemistry has taught me is that beyond our gender, beyond our race, beyond where we were born. We are all organic beings made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. We all have choices to make that will impact each other and impact our world in ways that we might not be able to predict or imagine. May your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. Thank you. Thank you.